Hi, I'm Greg Lang from Michigan State University. Very happy to be here. I appreciate the opportunity uh, Tiana DuPont uh, has given me to speak to the Cherry Institute. It's been probably a little more than 20 years since I was last uh, at a Cherry Institute. Um, I'm going to here to talk to you about uh, 10 years of results in the NC140 Cherry Training Systems and Rootstocks trial. This is a trial that uh, has been funded over the years for my part by the International Fruit Tree Association and the Michigan Tree Fruit Commission. I like to always start out with this picture of Italian cherry pickers uh, from many, many years ago. This was shared with me um, by uh, a friend of mine, Mimo Costa from University of Bologna. And it really illustrates the challenges of trying to grow cherries labor efficiently and profitably. And I like to give the background on why our trees are so big. The natural growth habit of a fruit tree varies a lot from peaches, plums, and apricots, their maximum height being 25 feet, to apples at 40 feet, to pears that could be up to 65 feet in nature. And then we get to cherries, cherries being a true forest tree that could grow to 135 feet tall. So this is what we're battling as we try to come up with ways to grow cherries in an orchard that are labor efficient. Over the years, what we've done is grown trees as multiple leaders so that we can diffuse all that vigor into all these different branches. But you can see with this tree, this is a picture taken of a 35 year old tree at WSU Prosser um, back when I worked at Washington State. And look at all that vigor in the tops of the trees. Even after 35 years, this tree is striving to uh, recover its natural forest tree form, growing five, six feet vertically straight up in the very tops of the trees. This is what we're challenged to deal with. So what we're uh, also trying to deal with is how to optimize sun exposure to the fruit. The higher the proportion of the fruit that's exposed to sunlight, the more uniform that fruit will be in its ripening quality and post-harvest performance. When we get sun into those fruits, they will lose more water than shaded fruits, but this drives the import of more sugar and nutrients, which gives the fruit greater growth. So you'll see bigger fruit generally in the sun than in the shade. And those fruit tend to be better flavored with higher sugars, better overall dry matter and calcium, which improves their firmness and their post-harvest life. And of course, if it's a blush cherry, better color for uh, that, that blush on the yellow fruit like Rainier's. Back in the late 90s, when I was at Washington State, we were really excited because we finally had a range of rootstocks that gave us dwarfing, semi-dwarfing, and semi-vigorous characteristics to our cherry trees. The challenges were how to grow large fruit on small trees in good quantities. So on around 2010, after about a decade of some physiological research, we said, we've got a pretty good idea of how to deconstruct the cherry canopy into fundamental fruiting units. And the question then is, with these different range of rootstocks, what are the appropriate tree architectures to take advantage of the different characteristics of the rootstock to achieve smaller trees and more sun exposed fruit. So we looked at the KGB, the Kim Green bush, and we imagined where the fundamental fruiting unit is in a KGB. We looked at the tall spindle axe or TSA, and we can imagine where the fruiting units are in the TSA. We looked at the center, super slender axe, which was developed by Stefano Masaki back when he was at University of Bologna. And this was very innovative in fruiting not on spur wood, but on the base of last year's shoots, giving us large firm cherries, uh, but small yield. So we had to grow at very high density. And then the upright fruiting offshoots training system that I started developing there at Prosser and that Matt Whiting refined when he took over uh, and came up with the uh, name uh, UFO. And we can look at the upright fruiting units on the UFO, which are very similar to the fruiting units on the KGB. 
So keeping these fruiting units in mind so that we could keep in mind fruit to leaf ratios to achieve good fruit size, that we then looked at how these different training systems acquired light, set fruit, set yields, et cetera. The way you train these trees, I won't go into because we covered that in the cherry training book that I'll talk about very briefly at the very end if you have not seen this book before, but it goes through step by step and uh, gives you detailed instructions on how to develop a TSA tree. What, you want, or what I want you to think about is the cherry growth habits in each of these training systems, is what the inherent shoot vigor is, what those shoot orientations are, if they're vertical or horizontal or pendant within the canopy, how the light is being intercepted and distributed. The good light, uh, uh, good leaf exposure gives us good carbon gain. Uh, leaves in the shade are having a respir respiration um, that loses carbon. And so when you think about a canopy, think about what parts of it are getting optimal light and what parts of it are getting shade? What parts are carbon positive contributing to the fruit growth? What parts are carbon neutral or negative that may be detracting from optimizing your profitability? So with a TSA tree, we can see we've got a, a good outer canopy. Uh, we've got some light channels of light moving into the interior of the canopy, depending on how we prune this conical form to try to minimize that shade in the middle that will dictate our light use efficiency. And we can see that as the canopy becomes more complex, as it becomes more irregular, or as it starts competing with neighboring trees as we move to high density orchards, we run into more and more issues with um, optimizing light and minimizing shade. We can look at the KGB, where the shade is or the light channels should be in a well-pruned tree. You can look at the SSA. We've reduced now that uh, shaded cone in a, in a SSA tree because we've moved to a two-dimensional canopy that the permanent structure, this is a very important point that you'll see why later, the permanent structure is very narrow. And then we've got the non-permanent structure in a mature tree, the shoots that grow out every year and are pruned back to just the, the permanent fruiting wood. So this is where our mindset is starting to change as we move from three-dimensional canopies into two-dimensional canopies. And then the UFO, which is a very narrow canopy and each fruiting unit is also very narrow, minimizing the shade and optimizing the carbon positive light interception. So here are our trees after about five years, I believe. Um, the three-dimensional central leader TSA on the left, the two-dimensional central leader SSA on the right. The three-dimensional KGB multiple leader tree on the left and the two-dimensional multiple leader tree, the UFO on the right. So this 3D versus 2D is something that I want you to think about because it's something that 10 years ago was relatively new for us. Here we can see the trees at about year six, probably KGB on Gisela six, being about six and a half feet wide, essentially from the bottom to the top. TSA being about five feet wide from the bottom and much narrower at the top. The SSA being about two feet wide and narrower at the top. And the UFO being about one foot wide uh, from the bottom to the top. So here, these, these widths, these maximum widths, wherever they occur in the canopy, uh, dictate part of how we will space our rows apart. So I said this is a trial with the NC140 group. This is a group of scientists that studies rootstocks and apples, cherries, pears, and peaches. And we create these uniform trials. We plant them across the country and then evaluate um, effects of varieties, effects of soils, effects of climate, et cetera. We planted this trial back in 2010 in 13 different sites across America, including California, Oregon, and Washington. But we lost eight of those sites over the years for various reasons, such that uh, by the end of the trial in 2019, we only had five sites with data from all 10 years. Those were Summerland with the cultivar Skeena, 
of course, Michigan with Benton. Uh, New York had two trials, one at uh, Cornell in Geneva and one with a grower in the Hudson Valley, both with Regina. And finally with Skeena up in Nova Scotia um, at the uh, Ag Canada Research Center up there. Now that one was not irrigated, so I'm not going to talk about any data from that trial. Due to time, I'm not going to talk about the trials in New York, basically because the trial in Michigan and the trial in Summerlin are the trials that probably come closest to conditions and situations that you will experience in the Pacific Northwest. All the trials, uh, all the treatments, all the rootstocks were planted at a uniform five foot spacing, except for the SSAs, which were twice as close because it's that ultra high density system. Now thinking about how to translate our trial data, which is on a per tree basis, to uh, and uniform spacing to a true orchard basis, we need to think about what the true orchard spacing would be for the different canopy architectures and for the different vigors of the rootstock. So to start to figure out true orchard spacing, uh, we look at tree spacing being the permanent mature canopy width, the dark green here on this slide, which will vary by rootstock system combination <clears throat> and by the annually removed shoot growth, uh, the new shoots that fill, once the tree has filled its mature space, the new shoots that grow out, and then we cut them back during the pruning uh, season, whether that's summer hedging or dormant or a combination of both. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have to add the width of the tractor as we figure out row spacing. So we've got the tractor width, plus the permanent structure of the tree, plus the annually removed shoot growth of the tree. That will give us our row spacing. Now we can think about the three dimensionality and, uh, of these trees. Looking at the top view here of KGBs and TSAs, we can see that as we move to a more vigorous rootstock, we're considering the tree to be a symmetrical uh, circle of structure and annual growth. So as the rootstock figure increases, not only does the tree spacing increase, but the row spacing must increase proportionally. This is where 2D is different. 2D row spacing remains constant regardless of the tree vigor. Now row spacing can also be influenced by tree height. We used to say the height to row width um, should be such that the rows shouldn't be any wider than the tree is tall. But this is starting to change now that we're moving to 2D systems because we get better light permeability in a very narrow canopy. And it also changes as we move to dual plane V or Y type canopy shapes. So the tree spacing that we are using to multiply out the yields that we get in our trials to get orchard yields uh, for these different rootstock and training system combinations are listed here, ranging from five to seven feet between trees um, on KGB at Gisela three up to Gisela six, um, <clears throat> down to two and a half feet by nine foot row spacings for the SSAs. So again, you see here, both tree spacing and row spacing increase with vigor of rootstock in a 3D system, but only the tree spacing increases with increasing vigor in it by rootstock in a 2D system. The row spacings stay exactly the same. And the row spacings depend on the width of the permanent structure of the canopy. So our results in Michigan with Benton um, are seen here in terms of tree vigor, trunk cross-sectional area or tree diameter. And as we would expect, the smallest trees in the KGB training system were Gisela three, and the largest were on Gisela 6, so dwarfing, semi-dwarfing, and semi-vigorous rootstocks. But we also see here that KGB trees were much more vigorous across rootstocks compared to the TSA and the UFO trees, which were statistically pretty similar, except for TSA on Gisela 6, which was much more vigorous than UFO on Gisela 6. And we see the SSA trees which are planted twice as close, so they have much more significant root competition 
which reduces growth. They are also pruned much more severely every year, which reduces growth. So looking at the per orchard yields now, based on uh, estimated tree spacings, we can see that in the first year of yield, which was year four for us, because in year three, we bloomed five weeks early. We had a number of frost events then that uh, wiped out our trees, uh, wiped out the flowers, I should say. It actually killed the spurs, which affected our yields for the next several years because we had dead spurs and had to regrow fruiting wood to recreate uh, the training systems that had spur bearing uh, fruiting units. Um, so in year four, which was our first harvest in Michigan, as opposed to what we expected in year three, the SSA had the highest productivity and the Gisela three across all training systems was the most precocious rootstock, most productive. In year five, we see that the TSA on Gisela three uh, surpassed the SSA, the early precocity. Uh, now that the TSA started to mature some of its spurs, we have fruiting both on the bases of the new shoots in the TSA and the spurs of the TSA. So the yields are increasing more rapidly than on the SSA. And as the spurs mature on the UFO and the KGB, they are beginning to uh, increase as well. The KGB and the Gisela 6 were consistently in the first uh, couple of years, the least precocious. We look at year six, the highest yields now are pretty much neck and neck with uh, TSA and UFO on Gisela 3, followed by Gisela 3 KGBs, Gisela 3 SSAs, and the Gisela 5 UFOs. So what's interesting in the data is I can compare these first three years where we get an initial snapshot with the next three years as the trees fully fill their space and mature. And we see that in year seven, UFO on Gisela three was the most productive. We look at year eight, and again, the UFO and the SSA on Gisela three were most productive, followed by the KGB on Gisela three and the UFO on Gisela five. And in year nine, it's the KGB on Gisela three and the UFO on Gisela five that were most productive. So comparing the first three years of production with the more mature three years of production, we see that the KGB on Gisela three was similar in those two three year periods. But as the KGB canopies matured on those more vigorous rootstocks, we increased in yields. With the SSA production actually decreased for the second three years compared to the first three years. And it was the same uh, between those three year periods on Gisela six, but that's absolutely the worst combination, the most vigorous rootstock on the highest density uh, training system. So um, it doesn't matter that those are equal. Um, it's, it's a mistake uh, that no grower should make. TSA uh, decreased across all rootstocks in the more mature three years compared to the early three years. And the UFO, even though it was among the highest yielding in the first three years, it increased even more in the second three years on Gisela three and Gisela five. Only on Gisela six was it similar. So we put in here uh, the last year, so years four to 10, and you can see the Gisela three UFO tree was far above, or trees were far above, uh, the next sets of trees. And I've taken this data, which is in metric tons per hectare. I've translated it now to tons per hectare. I've also tweaked it a little bit because we've revised the spacing based on those early predictions of tree spacing to the predictions that I showed you in an earlier slide. So using those earlier slide tree spacings, these are the final uh, per orchard yields. Highest yielding was UFO on Gisela three, followed by KGB on Gisela 3, then TSA on Gisela 3, then UFO on Gisela 5, and then the SSA on Gisela 3. So those were the top five out of the 11 combinations. We turn to British Columbia, which had eight years worth of data rather than seven years, and it's a self-fertile variety in a much better, more consistent uh, growing climate, more sun, uh, better light, 
etc. And you can see the yields are much, much higher. Um, the highest yields, again, though, were the UFO on Gisela 3, 116 tons over this eight year period, um, followed by only 80 tons uh, per acre uh, with the TSA on Gisela 3. The third most was UFO on Gisela 5, followed by the TSA on Gisela 5. And the fifth was UFO on Gisela 6. So we can see across the country, two totally different growing locations, two totally different types of varieties, a low productive variety like Benton and a high productive variety like Skeena. And the UFO planar system uh, is giving very high yields, followed by the TSA, the more traditional system. The last bit of data that we did, uh, similar to things that Matt Whiting has shown over and over again, and that is the time that it takes and the efficiency of picking from a planar system. It took two minutes to pick a pound of fruit with our very slow uh, but replicated pickers, um, non-professional pickers here in Michigan in the trial. 5% longer to pick a, a pound of fruit on a KGB, 10% longer to pick a pound of fruit on SSA, and a whopping almost 40% longer to pick a pound of fruit off of a TSA tree. So even though those TSA trees were were second in yield, you add in the uh, much lower efficiency of picking, and we see a, an even bigger difference in terms of profitability. So this hasn't been lost on growers around the world. I think New Zealand probably leads the, the, the world in adopting UFO type orchards. There's more than 250 acres of commercial orchards there now. Uh, in fact, the, the researchers there in, in New Zealand are not only looking at cherries, uh, in a UFO type training, which they call FOPs for future orchard production systems, but also apples and pears and, and apricots. This type of planar system allows us to move to very precise uh, development of simplified fruiting units. We're using twine to uh, make sure we fill our space very efficiently with our fruiting units, eight centimeters, uh, 20 centimeters apart, which is eight inches. This gives us the ability to start to predict the leaf area per acre uh, that will support a fruit load for 11 gram fruit size. Um, we've shown that in this V type system, we could project with a productive variety, 12.3 tons per acre of 11 gram fruits. We've also gone back to the very first UFO type training system I developed there in Prosser in 1999. This is a double row, uh, but vertical. And here we get up to 11,500 uprights per acre, which can project out to a leaf area that should be able to support 14 tons of fruit at 11 grams per fruit size. The thing that I really like about these vertical planar systems is the potential for things like sensor arrays on robots or tractors to start to quantify our spurs and our bud flower counts that can help us with uh, crop load management, can help with spraying, precision spraying, or selective spraying, or even future elective, uh, selective thinning of heavy clusters of fruit uh, in cherries and, and not thinning the, the lighter clusters. So I could envision something like this, machines that are built to go over the row for spraying, for potential thinning, um, for hedging very effectively, still following up with hand pruning, et cetera. But what we're seeing is labor efficiencies being so important uh, with higher prices, with uh, uh, less availability. This is the kind of system I think we're going to. So just to finish up, I mentioned the pruning and training book that we wrote about five or six years ago. It's available free. You can download it off the internet at the website here. It can be downloaded in Spanish. It can also be uh, accessed uh, as an app on your iPhone or your Android based uh, smartphone or tablet. And hot off the presses, uh, Lynn Long and uh, Clive Kaiser and I just finished a very practical book on cherry production. We go through cherry flowering, cultivars, rootstocks, establishing, uh, planning and establishing your new orchard, uh, fundamentals of pruning, different training systems, managing the environment for frost, for rain, for wind. 
uh, go through fruit ripening and harvest, managing pests and pathogens, etc. And it's available at these websites. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak at the Cherry Institute again. It's been um, a long time. I look forward to the pandemic being over and hopefully seeing uh, many of you out in the Pacific Northwest on future travels. And you're always welcome to come and visit me here in Michigan. Thank you, Tiana. And uh, you all stay, take care and, and stay healthy.